in the mid 19th century, all the theories and ideas about electromagnetism were not fully yet understood and seemed to separate. James Clerk Maxwell wanted to collect all of them and set up a universal electromagnetism law that everyone can understand and explains the relationship between electricity and magnetism well. One of those laws was Coulomb's law, which states that if there is a non-zero charge density within a volume, that will constitute a non-zero outwards or inwards electric flux density throughout the surface of that volume which encloses that charge. And the direction of the flux density depends on the sign of the charge. And this is our first law. And the second one was the Ampere's law, stating that if there is a line of charge that flows through that line, which is electric current that flows through a line of wire, that will always create a solenoidal magnetic field around it. Other law, which is probably the most famous one, is known by its name, is Faraday's law. And it states that if there is a non-zero changing magnetic field, the magnetic field should change with respect to time, that will in turn create a voltage that is changing with respect to time around a loop so that it is called Faraday's law of induction, electromagnetic induction, that will induce a voltage. In other words, that means if you have a loop of wire and there is a magnetic field around it which is moving or changing rapidly, that will induce a current on the wire or that will induce a non-zero voltage over the wire. And the last one is about the magnetic charge that in nature you cannot find any single magnetic charge that looks like electric charge. That means there will be no positive or negative or only north or only south magnetic charge in nature. So the magnetic charge in nature will always have to be together. That means a magnet will always have a north and south pole where the magnetic field exits north pole and terminates on the south pole. Exits one pole and terminates the other. So that will create a loop. So magnetic field comes in loops in nature. And this was the fourth one. And there it is. So these are the Maxwell's equations. But at that time, he also noticed that there's a problem with the second equation. If you know the continuity equation, which tells us that the negative rate of change of the charge density with respect to time will constitute a divergence of a current density. That means if there is a change of charge with respect to time, there will be electric current. And the continuity equation is also valid for electrodynamics. That means when there is a time rate of change of everything. And according to continuity equation, we can apply divergence to the second equation of Maxwell's equations, that will be divergence of curl of magnetic field would be equal to divergence of J, which is the continuity equation. This must be equal to the negative rate of change of the charge density with respect to time. However, according to a mathematical identity, we know that the divergence of the curl of any field, any vector field, must be zero. This must be zero. And this cannot be true because we have a non-zero charge density which oscillates with respect to time and this cannot be zero. So in this case, we can apply a clever trick to equation two and say that when partial rho, partial t minus partial rho partial t is equal to zero, does not literally mean that charge densities are zero. Charge densities can be anything and this equation will again zero. Therefore, instead of saying divergence of curl of H is equal to divergence of J, we can also say there should be a term which is actually the negative of the continuity. That means since divergence of J is equal to minus partial rho partial T, this will become zero, but this is also satisfied because this identity must be zero and the equation is also satisfied. So therefore, we can also say since the divergence of d is actually the rho, we can put divergence of d instead of rho, which will be as follows. Curl of h be equal to divergence of j 
plus partial divergence of D partial T. And we can take the divergence outside because it's a linear operator and cancel all the divergences and we will left with curl of H is equal to the current density plus the time rate of change of the electric flux density. And this is the missing piece of Maxwell's equations. So these are the Maxwell's equations and this is the intelligence of James Clark Maxwell. But the second equation tells us something weird that if you have a changing magnetic field that will create an electric field which is also changing and if you have a changing electric field that will also create a changing magnetic field even if there is no current flow. If J is zero, this equation is valid. If J is zero, there will still be a magnetic field created by an electric field. And if you have an electric field, there will be magnetic field. And if you have a magnetic field, there will be another electric field again. And there will be another magnetic field, another electric field, and that will go like a chain throughout the space. And I accidentally erased the magnetic field, but it will not disappear. This will create an electromagnetic wave. And this is the ultimate proof that electromagnetic waves exist. And after a certain time, they won't need any source. In this case, the source is actually our circuit. And every circuit is an antenna so that it can generate changing electric and magnetic fields if there are changing voltage over the circuit and it will create an electromagnetic field. We also know that the strength of the fields will be reduced roughly according to the inverse square law so that they will not be able to go to infinity. I would like to show you the meaning of this equation experimentally in a real experiment where electric field can really create a magnetic field. The demonstration that I'm going to perform requires expertise. Please do not try this at home. Now we have two pieces of rectangular copper plates. I will plug one to line and one to neutral of the volt plug, but they will never touch each other. That means they will not close the loop of the circuits. The gap between them will have a changing electric field, which will create a changing magnetic field, inducing a current back on the other half of the circuit. Our multimeter has a huge resistance that can read a voltage. The presence of a voltage means that there is a non-zero electric current flowing in the loop even if the loop is cut in half. Now I'm plugging in. As you can see, we have almost 24 volt AC voltage reading. That means displacement current is real. Electromagnetic waves can occur when there are no charges around. If I reduce this gap, you will see after a certain point the voltage will sharply increase. As you can see, it increases almost over 30 volts AC. What I actually do here is creating a capacitance in the circuit. And as you know, capacitors let AC to pass through. And this is why they do that, the displacement current. But here, since the capacitance of parallel plates are tiny, the impedance is huge and that impedes the current way too much. You will see that even the voltage level reaches almost 30 volts AC. When I connect an LED, it is not even enough to light it up brightly due to lack of power and high impedance of the plates. But an interesting thing happens when I decided to be mad and touch neutral plates. Now I didn't get shock, but instead, light of the LED suddenly increases because my body increases the capacitance that reduces the total impedance in the circuit and more current passes through the LED. But the most important thing here is to see that Maxwell was right and this is the way electricity and magnetism works. This is how electromagnetic waves formed and they carry power to the other side of our cable, even if that power is reduced considerably. From one plate to the other.